Chapter 8, Topic 8.1, Introduction to Genetics and Genes. In this topic, the objectives are define the terms genome and gene, differentiate between genotype and phenotype, draw a picture of a length of DNA, including all important chemical groups, explain how DNA replication takes place, know the enzymes, use Okasaki fragments to explain leading and lagging strands. In this topic lecture, we're going to cover a review of the structure of DNA, genotype and phenotype, DNA and chromosomes, and DNA replication. First, let's review the structure of nucleic, uh, nucleic acids and their monomers, nucleotides. Let's start with nucleotides. Now you'll remember this uh, diagram from chapter 2. Oh no, chapter 2! Yes, there's lots of chemistry in this chapter 2. But you'll see down here we have our sugar, ribose. It's a 5-carbon sugar. Okay. And over here we have a phosphate group. Remember, it's the phosphate group this, that makes a nucleic acid an acid. And then over here we have our nitrogenous base. We usually call this just a base. Shorten it down. Now you hook these together and if we are using this diagram, um, these are the sugars and the phosphates, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphates hooked together. Okay, that's the back bone of the nucleic acid. Then the bases turn inward. Then we can get another strand of DNA and these bases are going to hold hands. And this is what creates the famous double helix. Now, here's something I want you to remember. A adenine always goes with thymine. A goes with T. G goes with C. This is always the case for DNA. So A is always going to match up with T. G is always going to match up with C. And this is part of how the cell can make exact duplicates of its DNA. We're going to talk about this more when we talk about DNA replication. Now let's talk about the difference between genotype and phenotype. Let's start with eukaryotic organisms, which you're more familiar with. In fact, if you've had Biology 201, we talked about Mendel's pea plants. That's why I have a picture of a pea flower here. So the genotype in eukaryotes are all the genes that are present in the cell. That is the genotype. The phenotype is what's expressed. Now in eukaryotes you have two copies of each gene, generally speaking. Fungi are different. But for most of them you have two copies. And so you have a dominant and you have a recessive gene and the dominant one is the one that's expressed. Well in bacteria and archaea they only have one copy of, the, of each gene. So we use the terms genotype and phenotype a little bit differently. Genotype are all the genes, same as with eukaryotes. Phenotype are the genes that are turned on, the genes that are currently being expressed. So let's talk about an example. Let's talk about the life cycle of E. coli in places where you don't have water treatment. So E. coli are happily living in your intestines and they're using their fembrae to hold on to your intestinal cells. But those intestinal cells are constantly being shed and E. coli leave in the feces. So eventually those E. coli are going to make it into the local water supply. We're going to say that it uh, gets washed out of uh, the outhouse and down into the river. Now E. coli don't particularly want to live in the river. They want to live in somebody's intestines. That's what they're built for. So they stop making fembrae once they leave human intestines. They're floating along without fembrae, just waiting to be drunk. And they, once they're drunk, they don't produce fembrae in your mouth. They don't want to stay in your mouth. They don't want to stay in your stomach. They start producing fembrae once they enter the small intestine. Then they can grab a hold again. Okay. I hope that hasn't grossed you out too much. But you see the difference between genotype and phenotype. The E. coli that are swimming around in the river have the genes for fembrae, but they're not turned on. So the phenotype is to not have fembrae. Once they get into the human intestines, those genes are turned on and the phenotype is for fembrae. Now let's talk about chromosomes. Okay, in eukaryotes, chromosomes are linear. 
Okay, the purple lines are the sugar phosphate backbone, the red lines are the bases holding hands, and in most eukaryotes, fungi excluded, you have two copies, one from the mother, one from the father. In bacteria and archaea, most of the time, the chromosomes are circular. You don't have ends. Now, this can be handy in certain circumstances, but we're not going to cover that in this class. But what you need to remember, most eukaryotes have linear chromosomes, most prokaryotes have circular chromosomes. Now from there they get packaged um, and we don't really need to worry about that in this class but let's talk about making a copy of the DNA. We call this DNA replication. Anytime a cell divides, whether it's the cells in your uh, dermal layer of your skin or the prokaryotic E. coli in your gut, every time those cells divide, each cell needs to have a copy of the DNA. Otherwise, they won't know what proteins to make, so you have to make copies. So, when we do this, we split the double helix, so we have a template strand, one that's going to be a copy for the new strand. And we make this new strand by hooking the sugars and the phosphates, excuse me, phosphates, sugars, phosphates, sugars, phosphates, sugars together. And we always go from the five prime end to the three prime end. Now, if you want to know what that means, get with me during class. But what you need to remember always goes five prime, three prime. The other side, here's the five prime end, three prime end. So they are anti parallel. So what happens is DNA polymerase comes along and matches up the bases that go with each other. And they come in as triphosphates. Then as they get hooked together in a, that's right, a dehydration reaction, we clip off three of these phosphates. That provides the energy for the reaction. So the DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that does this, hooks them together. Then we have another one that comes in. So what's going to match with the C? That's right, we're going to have G matching with the C, and so on and so forth. Now let's expand out and see what's happening on the entire chromosome. Now for me, it's easier to remember what's happening by remembering the, heat, the enzymes that are doing the jobs. So the parental DNA is unwound okay, by a helicase. Helicase unwinds the helix, unzips them. Then you get proteins that stabilize the single strands so they don't go back and hold hands with each other. Now, DNA polymerase sets down and starts polymerizing the new strand like we talked about in the previous slide. But it can't get its mouth around a single strand. It can only get its mouth around a double strand. So, an RNA primer, we call it primase in this situation, it can get its mouth around a single strand. Doesn't care. So it makes a DNA RNA hybrid, then the DNA polymerase can grab a hold and start polymerizing. Now, on the strand that's going three prime to five prime, it can go continuously. We call this the leading strand. On the other strand, the DNA polymerase keeps running in to new to previous primers. As this gets unwound, primase comes up, makes an RNA primer, DNA polymerase attaches here goes down, runs into the primer, falls off. So what happens is we call this the lagging strand and these segments of DNA are called Okazaki fragments. Now we can't have an RNA DNA hybrid. It's not as stable as a DNA DNA strand. Another DNA polymerase comes through and replaces the RNA primer and replaces it with DNA. Then DNA ligase comes through, hooks the 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 pieces together and we get one continuous strand. Now I'm going to show you an animation. And in the interest of uh, making sure that copyrights are, are kept to, I got it from McGraw-Hill. And this is the website where you can go to. And here comes the animation. The replication of DNA begins at a sequence of nucleotides called the origin of replication. Helicase unwinds the double-stranded DNA helix and single-strand binding proteins react with the single-stranded regions of the DNA and stabilize it. 
DNA polymerase 3 is the major enzyme involved in DNA replication. DNA polymerase 3 can only add a nucleotide to the 3' prime end of a pre-existing chain of nucleotides, and it cannot initiate a nucleotide chain. Therefore, an RNA polymerase, called a primase, constructs an RNA primer, a sequence of about 10 nucleotides, complementary to the parent DNA. DNA polymerase 3 can then add deoxyribonucleotides to synthesize the new complementary strand of DNA. Because the two parent strands of DNA are antiparallel, they are oriented in opposite directions and must therefore be elongated by different mechanisms. The leading strand elongates toward the replication fork by adding nucleotides continuously to its growing three prime end. In contrast, the lagging strand, which elongates away from the replication fork, is synthesized discontinuously as a series of short segments called Okazaki fragments. When the DNA polymerase 3 reaches the RNA primer on the lagging strand, it is replaced by DNA polymerase 1, which removes the RNA and replaces it with DNA. DNA ligase then attaches and forms phosphodiester bonds. The DNA is further unwound, new primers are made, and DNA polymerase 3 jumps ahead to begin synthesizing another Okazaki fragment. For simplicity, DNA polymerase 3 has been depicted as separate units, one acting on the leading strand and the other acting on the lagging strand. The current view of DNA polymerase 3 is that the two subunits function together with the DNA on the lagging strand, folding to allow the dimeric DNA polymerase molecule to replicate both strands of the parental DNA duplex simultaneously. Proteins other than DNA polymerase 3 are not shown. So, as a reminder of what the learning objectives for this topic are, you should be able to now define the terms genome and gene, differentiate between genotype and phenotype, draw a picture of a length of DNA, including all important chemical groups, explain how DNA replication takes place, make sure you know the enzymes, and use Okasaki fragments to explain leading and lagging strands.